Okay, we're back. Hi, Loiso. Hey, my superhero friend. We made it. Ep two. Yeah, we are back at it, saving the world one episode at a time. How did you feel now that we are clearly international podcasting stars already? I can't wait until Spotify buys us out entirely and uh, we're just oh. making millions. Are they not called you? Oh, that's awkward. Oh, oh, wow. Mm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was going to tell you, I'm, I'm co-hosting <laughs> with Mr. Rogan as of next week. <laughs> You'll talk about how the aliens have come to save us. Cool. You've changed. You've changed so quickly. Fame yep. does, fame changes so know. quickly. What can I say? One, one episode. Fame changes One people. episode. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to An Idiot's Guide to Saving the World. I'm Luis Omating. And I am Gail Galli. This is the podcast for anyone who cares about building a better world, but doesn't quite know where to start. In this series, we use the United Nations Plan for a Better World, aka the Global Goals, to help us identify who's already chipping away at the big problems and to see how average Joes like me and me can join in to become a positive force. Each week, we look at one of the 17 and meet the people finding solutions to achieve the Global Goals. In this episode, how can we give a warm home to people forced to flee theirs? What rights do refugees have and which refugees currently have none? What's it like to just pack up your home and go? Plus, we find out just how much love a human heart can give. I'm thinking we're doing a podcast and we're all excited about it. I've never understood why is it not basically like the radio. I love podcasts. I don't even listen to the radio anymore because podcasts are essentially the best bits of radio on your own time because the news doesn't always give you what you even need to be hearing in that moment. Yeah, I get. Yeah, you are choosing what you listen to. And actually, let's go back to the news aspect because I feel like that is so relevant to what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about the refugee crisis in all its aspects. But if you were only relying on the news right now, I don't know how it is in South Africa. In the UK, you would think there's, we've just invented refugees, right? And they're coming from Ukraine. And that's the first time anybody's heard of it because, and it is a terrible, terrible situation. So please don't get me wrong. But what it raises, and, and people are responding to this in this way, we've had refugee crises for so long. And, you know, we are not covering them still. This one, is it resonating with you guys? But this one is dominating like a thousand percent. Well, Gail, as a attempting to be a first world country, we too have uh, our share of uh, immigration and refugee crises that we try to, you know, not talk about in the news because we have a lot of Zimbabweans coming through, Somalians coming through, but we barely talk about their crises. But the Ukrainian story is the story right now, which is important because it does put the refugee spotlight back into people's minds. But also it's strange how it's a popularity thing. It's like the popular refugee story. I had a, another podcast, not as good as us, but I did hear another podcast to say, the moment the news became a commodified entertainment channel, we lost truth in the world. Yeah, because that's what makes up reality is the news. The news is about what's new, essentially. It's in, it's in, in the word itself. You know, it's all about the excitement of some, some breaking news, something that no one else has heard about. And then you forget about the stuff we were trying to deal with before which then makes what's not reported seem like it's not happening, which would be wonderful if that was actually true because Boko Haram wouldn't exist anymore. Uh, Trump wouldn't exist anymore. You know, that's just not how it is. And uh, I think that's where the, the real um, danger is. It's really, really difficult. And that's, I think, what we're going to have to navigate in this episode because these times are hard. This subject is really difficult. It doesn't have its own global goal in the sense that there isn't a end the refugee crisis as a goal. But we have peace and justice, which is number 16. It tends to come from conflict. So it's housed there. But really, once you become a refugee or an asylum seeker, you're just running through those goals. You know, you, you chances are you've lost a degree, if not all of your income. So you're in the poverty, number one. Your number one priority will be food, feeding you and your family. That's zero hunger. Number two, health. Number three, that's going to suffer. Four, your kids are going to be out of school. Like, and, and, and. So it, it feels like it's a really rich one for us to be discovering this episode. And I'm glad we are. But I'm also really looking forward to hearing from guests who 
I've got some ideas about what we can do. Because, I mean, the worst thing is how helpless it can make you feel, right? Oh, of course. And I think the numbers don't help because all we get is bombarded by the numbers, which don't mean anything. So then we our next stop is the politics. So, I mean, you know the numbers better than I do, but what do they actually even mean? I think already there's three and a half million people have left Ukraine. And this is like one month in, three and a half million. There's nothing in my life that I can reference three million to. Like the first time I ever had a concept of 100,000 was in a stadium. So the gap between that, that's the biggest number I can humanly think of. So when you say 3.6 million and you're not talking about money, Gail, I don't know what you're talking about. No, that's not our new podcast salary. Um, that is apparently the amount of people who've already left. They could easily get to 10 million. And I know that in total in the world, and this was in 2020, so it's still going to have gone up. Last time they counted, it was 84 million people were no longer living where they would have chosen to live. 84 million. Yeah, well, I hope we can get into the the human stories in this episode because we get bombarded by these numbers. Maybe we can get into what the real on the ground reality of the refugee crisis actually is and what the people who are doing are actually doing because beyond the politics, there has to be more human, more heart to heart type of solutions. Well, we are about to do exactly that. I'm so excited to say that we're going to be joined by Jazz O'Hara. She is a storyteller by trade. She's the founder of something called the Worldwide Tribe, which is an organization and a community which raises awareness for refugees and it supports people who are caught up in that crisis. So she's on the road right now and she's joining us live. Jazz, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Where are you right now? Tell us where you're um, recording this from because I know you're on the road already. Yes, I'm in Istanbul at the moment. It's stop number three of a big journey that we're currently on recording the next season of our podcast, which is called Asylum Speakers. And we came from Beirut last week. Next stop, we're heading towards Greece and we're following common routes taken by refugees and asylum seekers from North Africa and the Middle East towards Northern Europe. That was a brilliant plug, by the way. Uh, please plug us on your podcast. <laughs> Got that in there straight away. <laughs> Uh, the thing I know that I don't think Louisa knows is how you got into this area. Our whole episode is talking about refugees. Obviously, we're recording this one since Russia has invaded Ukraine, and that's produced a whole new set of refugees. So we'll talk about that in a sec. But you've been doing this for a while. Can you tell us how? Because I, I think your story is super interesting. It comes from quite a personal place, I guess. It was nearly seven years ago that my mum and dad were coming to the end of a long process of becoming either foster or adoptive parents. And this happened because um, my youngest brother, Finn, was turning 18 and looking to leave home. So my mum and dad were worried about having no kids at home anymore. And it became clear that they live in Kent in the south of the UK and that there was a need for host families for unaccompanied minors, for children that were arriving as refugees to the UK alone. At this time, there was a lot of news about the notorious Calais jungle and it looked very likely that my new brother or sister would be coming via this camp because people were crossing the channel, you know, not so much on boats at the time, but in the back of lorries, hiding under the train, doing these crazy life-threatening journeys to, to make it to Kent. So I went to Calais to try and find out a little bit more about where my new sibling might be coming from. And I found a situation there that was very different from the situation that was portrayed in the media, that I met people with the most incredible stories and not just refugees coming from Syria, which was my my limited understanding of, of, of the refugee crisis. Um, I met people from Sudan and from Eritrea and from Afghanistan and Anyway, a couple of months later, my brother joined my family, an Eritrean boy called Mez. He was 13 years old. Uh, he'd had a crazy journey crossing the Sahara, the Mediterranean Sea, walking across Europe on foot, uh, all to flee compulsory military service in his home country. He didn't want to be a child soldier. And uh, and Mez is, is the first of four foster brothers I now have from Eritrea, Sudan, Libya and Afghanistan. They all live at home with my mum and dad. And uh, yeah, they've, they've changed my life. They're the, the reason why I do what I do. And do you find that uh, on occasion, Mez will win an argument by just saying, I didn't walk across Europe for this? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, he, those boys, they definitely get away with a lot more at home. That is for sure. <laughs> um, but it's, it's fascinating that you bring this up because I guess with a lot of these issues that uh, the global goals try to solve, we're realizing that it's all about what is in the media now. And with Ukraine, what it does do is it brings to light the refugee issue, uh, which, you know, is not new. And you would probably know more about the ones that we don't know about. And it would be great if you just enlighten us on the refugee movement of other countries and where people are currently going, where they can go and where they can't. Absolutely. And I really appreciate you for bringing this up because I think it's really important in these moments of global outrage and I guess attention to add, and you know, this is not what about, this is and, you know, this is a case of like, yes, the situation in Ukraine is terrible and we have to open our minds and our hearts and our spaces to uh, Ukrainian people. And also these refugees that have been in this similar situation for, for many years. So absolutely, it's been quite a difficult one to swallow, I guess, in a sense, the way that for example, in Calais, we're seeing this kind of two-tiered system of refugees that people that have been living in tents in the woods or in, in Calais for years now, Sudanese, Eritrean refugees, uh, unable to cross and risking their lives to cross. Uh, it's difficult for them to see how uh, brands, organizations, governments are responding uh, now. For example, Eurostar offering free rides to Ukrainians, which is, of course, necessary and important, but it's really important to recognize that we do have the capacity to extend our compassion beyond one crisis. Um, we're in Turkey because it's a, a huge host country for refugees, the biggest um, community of refugees in the world. Gosh, that's interesting. Turkey's the biggest host country in the world. Is that a kind of relative mm -hmm. to its population or in absolute numbers? In numbers. So relative to population, Lebanon, a quarter of the population of Lebanon are, is a refugee. Oh, so wow. when we think about our part in the UK or in Europe, actually, we're miles behind that in terms of our numbers in total and per capita. And it's not necessarily a country compared to Europe that has the resources to support this many people. So yeah, Turkey has, has many Syrians. Also, we've been meeting a large community of Uyghur people from East Turkestan here. We, we heard some incredible stories that I had never heard firsthand and that I really feel that the world needs to hear. See, that's fascinating because the whole Uyghur issue was popular two years back and then that fell silent to you know the next issue so my question i guess would be these countries that are more welcoming to the refugees they obviously kind of form a a route for refugees but are these are these benevolent routes in terms of the the, the agents that are moving people through I mean, unfortunately, the stories that I'm hearing would suggest not. Maybe I should use the, the example of my little brother, Mez, who took a common route. He left Eritrea and traveled through Sudan and then crossed the Sahara Desert to get into Libya. And that was at the hands of, of smugglers. And it was a very difficult journey. You know, they leave people behind. Mez's friend was left behind in the desert. You went for 15 days without food. Uh, and, you know, in Libya, many refugees describe it to be hell on earth. And then crossing the sea, you know, we've all seen pictures and videos of, of what that looks like. And then even once arriving in Europe, you know, you would think, and Mez thought this too, that once arriving in Italy, that he'd arrived to Europe, that he would be safe, that this is the country that he could go to school. And that was, again, not possible in Italy. He met people from Eritrea that had made this journey before him who told him, don't stay here because we're, they're deporting people to Eritrea. And that was Mez's biggest fear that, you know, we might think of Italy as a safe country for you or I, but if you're a refugee facing deportation and that that would lead to your death, then that's definitely not a safe place to be. And that goes for other countries in Europe too, France or other countries that have large uh, or larger numbers of refugee claims, asylum claims in the UK. And for that reason, increased likelihood of being denied and deported. Well, Jess, um, there must be some kind of hope. There must be stories of positive light in what are the darkest stories that um, I've heard in a long time. I mean, like, can you tell us a story of an organization maybe that you've worked with? Just anything at this point. 
<laughs> yeah, of course. Out of pain comes incredible creativity, right? And like we, I really saw that in Beirut. Like on the last day, we went to the Bekar Valley with a couple and they run something called the Great Oven. And it's the most amazing organization. They basically build and paint these like massive community ovens where you can put like, I don't know, hundreds of aubergines in there and you've got like baba ganoush for the whole town they donated one to a syrian community and it's run by this amazing group of syrian women and they feed their whole community from this oven every single day um, and they're donating an oven in colombia as well for venezuelan refugees fantastic it's really cool your mum's a pretty good inspirational story as well so your mum had Got four of you out the door and then she went, okay, I'll, I'll get another four in. Is she going to stop? Or is she just going to keep having them until she dies? We'll see. I don't think she could say no more now because, yeah, maybe when Mez moves out, I don't know. But, you know, she is a really good example for me that our capacity to love is infinite. And, that you know, even that love of a parent that you might think it only extends to your biological kids, but I've definitely seen four times over that it extends to anybody that you put yourself in that role for as parent, as brother, as sister. I feel the same towards those boys as I do my biological brothers. And that's, you know, up and down, lots of love, but also they're li my little brothers, so they can be annoying for sure as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's just such a real topic right now, isn't it? It's the first time that the British government, in my memory, have said, yes, you are allowed to house a, a family coming from Ukraine. You know, they didn't say that during Syria. They didn't say that during Afghanistan or Yemen or, and you know, you name it. But I think it's the first time I think most people in the UK have had that consideration. I presume your mum would be an advocate for it, right? But what would you say to anyone listening to this who... They don't have to adopt four children. That will make them probably quite scared at once at least. <laughs> but what are the first steps that somebody who is empathetic to all refugees, and maybe this is just the thing that tips them over, what are the first steps that you recommend they could do? How can they get involved? Well, I would say that anybody who is thinking about hosting a Ukrainian family, for us, you know, the first time when Mez joined the family, people said, oh, well, you know, it's, it's lucky that he fitted in so well and that he, you know, everything went so smoothly. And then that happened four times over. And I wouldn't say that everything was, I don't want to paint a picture that like everything was easy or rosy, but it has been a really beautiful experience for my family as well. We've learned a lot and we've got so much to kind of gain from experiencing and seeing our culture and our lives through different eyes, I think was a really beautiful experience for us. But my advice to people is always the first step that we can all do, that we all have access to is to learn as much as you can to understand as much as you can you know we have these resources at our fingertips I feel like that's the first step to change because I really believe that we're all connected and in in some sense and that the idea of refugee you know it's a label that we maybe feel far away from but actually it's something that happens to you and the Ukrainian situation I think has really made us recognize this more than ever that it's not who you are it's something that happens to you and it's something that could happen to any one of us at any time thank you for your work i mean you're doing an amazing job thanks so much yes have a have an amazing rest of your trip thank you guys What's so great about talking to jazz, and I know it's, it's weird to come out booming with positivity, but it, it's, it's such a heavy topic, but humanity keeps shining through. Um, we have a saying that, you know, it's become overused here in South Africa, but it still remains in, with its power, which is umuntung umuntung abantu, which means I am because you are. And that's just the basic, basic way of being a human being is just being a human being to other human beings. Yeah, I think also the way she focuses on these are just human beings and not 84 million people like, wow, that's so many. How can I change that? But actually, here's just a person or a family. And, you know, we can just engage with them and, and work out how I'm one human. I could help one other human. I did think it also it's such a great story. People, I think, are quite nervous about accepting refugees into their houses, you know, into their homes. And this lady has adopted four from four different countries. And it's such a positive experience. They show you also like you who you could be. You go, oh, I have an option to be that person too. And we all do. We absolutely all do. And I do believe people do. You know, you saw it in COVID. Everybody found out who was their neighbor and who needed the, mm. you know, the shopping done. And 
people went to extraordinary lengths to help each other. And I feel like the news, you know, talk, going back to the news we were talking about, is not helpful because it presents big numbers and it, it drives fear. You know, we get so locked in the fear of, of this whole conversation about refugees because we're always talking about like they're coming, they're coming and they're going to come take our resources and they're going to take our, they're going to take our land and our money and our Tabasco. And, and it's like, no, calm down. This is solvable because all it asks us to do is to help because it's going to be more and more of a thing, especially because it's caused by so many different issues, like the idea of climate refugees. That's not even on people's lips, but it's already a thing right now. People who are being forced out of where they live because of the changing climate and failing crops and all of that. And it's just not recognized as a type of refugee. Do you remember that caravan of people, it was called a caravan, that were coming up from Latin America and Mm. under the Trump administration and trying so hard to get through Mexico? I only understood quite long after that event, they were climate refugees. And, you know, that was several years ago. This is something that we need to learn more about. Not just learn more about, it needs to become an official thing because it's not, there are limitations on what a refugee even is currently. Whereas in the Ukraine, it's a war thing. So it's recognized. A lot of countries don't recognize climate refugees. And I had the opportunity to talk to Amali Tower, who is the founder of an organization called Climate Refugees, which calls for the protection and the rights of those displaced by climate change. And she started by explaining what being a refugee actually means according to the law. Refugee law is basically enshrined in the 1951 Refugee Convention. And basically a refugee is someone who has left their country and is fleeing conditions that can be described as persecution or conflict. And that persecution is based on five grounds of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or membership in a particular social group. So climate change is nowhere near within that very narrow definition, which many, many have argued for decades is a rather narrow definition. By and large, over the last 10 years, more people have fled conditions of climate change than they have conflict or violence. Just last year alone, 30.7 million people were displaced by climate-related conditions. That's more than three times as many people than conflict or violence. Now, most people are internally displaced. That means within the, you know, their own countries. But that, I think, creates an even bigger problem because people are displaced in the countries that are already on the front lines of the climate crisis that have very few means, options, tools, and, and you know, methods with which to protect their own citizens. Putting more pressure on specific parts of the country. Exactly. So countries that have had so little contribution to global warming and to climate change are now battling the ravages of this climate crisis. You know, there are the global north that controls who comes up within its its borders. You know, migration policy, all of this is very much unjust. And I think it is more than time and fair for us all as a global citizenry to ask a very fundamental question then, which is, you know, do our present laws and systems sort of like represent the conditions that many people in the world today, the vast majority are facing, are living with and are, quite frankly, you know, not able to survive. And so therefore, migration is not just a form of adaptation, but in many cases, people are migrating for survival. Is that part of the reason why on an international law level, then it's so hard to accept this weird term climate refugee? Do you then have to accept more than just this term? You kind of have to accept the history that has led to it and your part in it? Absolutely. And I think, and and that is where the struggle lies, right? Countries don't want to accept the term because then it would also come with it responsibility. If we have a system that essentially allows the powerful to dictate terms and to, you know, have a conversation that's really rooted in sort of like, you know, unjust principles, then we're just going to have this sort of circular logic, 
You know, how do we how do we equate the playing field? How do we make sure that the people who are the victims and also survivors, how do we make sure that they have an equal voice at the table? I think those are the conversations we need to have. And in order to have that conversation, you need to begin with the one you and I are having right now, which is to say that, hey, things are not do not look the way you think they look. But have have people been granted climate change asylum? There have been some interesting legal developments. Last year, there was um, an immigration case in France of a Bangladeshi man who, through his immigration case, which which really didn't have specifically anything to do with climate, but through the very like complicated process of appeals, et cetera, in the in the French immigration courts, a court upheld his his right to stay, saying that his health conditions, I think he had asthma or whatever, would be exacerbated by returning him to his country of origin because of the pollution in Bangladesh. Now, that's an incredibly important legal precedent. So there there really are a lot of individual things I can point to that collectively, I think, should give us all a lot of hope. Excellent. Okay, cool. Feeling better. Thank you. (laughs) Okay, we need to do something. And we can't wait for Superman. What can I do? I think the first and foremost thing that everybody must do is is get informed. And I often say that, you know, activism must be sustainable for us to actually have any lasting change. Because change does not happen incrementally, nor does it happen overnight, as, as you well know. The solutions won't come simply. So, for example, you know, changing legal definitions won't change the problem. Because first of all, what, what, what will that do? I mean, it's just because we give people status doesn't change the fact that they're being forced out of their homes. Does, does someone want to have to leave their home? Absolutely not. We should be working on things that allow people to stay. Migration is, is a right. Migration is a right if you want to move. Migration should also be a right to stay. She is naming something, I think, huge, which is if we don't address this whole issue of the migration of peoples, this is going to be the humanitarian issue that we have to sort this decade. There are going to be millions and millions more people on the move. And it just makes me realize we're all in this, right? There are potential climate refugees in all of us. For sure. We forget that You know, we can change these laws, as she said, but what does that help if, you know, people come and they still have to face the xenophobia of a place? Um, What she said was really powerful, too, at the end there. We should be working on things that allow people to stay because we're so focused a lot of the time on what happens when they come here. We forget that we can still make a difference in the places that they come from. I know. What we really need to be doing is sorting out the conditions where people are, for whatever reason, war and hunger and climate change, whatever those reasons are, we need to try and support people's homes. Yeah, it's so human to think that the end of the conversation is, I don't know what to do. And it's like, no, that's the most powerful part of the conversation. I don't know is the start of, oh, I need to find out. I think you've just done a little profound thing there. You've just totally reframed the idea of, like, I don't know, as a reason to not act as the reason to act. Well done you. I like that. Oh, thank you. Not just a piece of ass. (laughs) I've never said you that. I haven't even seen your ass. I've only seen your neck up. You might not have legs as far as I know. I don't know what your ass is like. (laughs) I mean, let's think about everything we've learned so far. We've learned how you can be a host, right, from Mm -hmm. Jazz and her incredible mum. We know that there's a new form of refugee coming called a climate refugee, and they need proper status and they need the law to fix that. So I think there's one more aspect that we're going to hear about now, and that is what is it like to go from like 0 to 60, right? Become a refugee overnight, and then you have to make the journey. My name is Hamid Amiri. I am 32, currently living at home. And for me, home at the moment is South Wales, Cardiff, UK, but obviously originally from Afghanistan. So home for me was uh, Afghanistan, Herat, and my first recollection is me with 
mum and dad and two brothers, one older, Hussein, and younger brother, Hassan. The best way I can describe Hussein is the sensible one that got on with everyone, me, the troublemaker, if I'm being honest, and Hassan, the quiet one. But we always had this thing where, even though we messed around and got a lot of trouble, we always had each other's back. I was born during the Taliban time. I think mum and dad tried to make it normal, try and allow us to have a normal life. But you kind of grow up in an environment where you know there are boundaries, where you know certain rules are in place, um, certain rules that doesn't make sense. We always knew we could be a mistake away from a serious consequences. But obviously, um, until age of 10, and things kind of took a turn. best way I can describe my mum. A powerhouse, uh, someone who's very strong-minded, very caring, looked after us, spoiled us, but she was very strong-minded and she still is. Organically or naturally, she became a mentor to the other kids, especially girls. Over time, she gets more and more frustrated and angry because the girls that she looks after and she mentors go on to not have a fair opportunity, go on to get married at a young age, go on to not have a voice which led her to simply stand up and give a speech about women's rights, about equality. And it was a huge success. And the best way I described it, the success became the consequences because somewhere along that audience, someone reported the Taliban and just like that, there was an execution order for my mum. It was like my life was turned upside down. What do we do next at a pace that you can't even imagine or comprehend, which led to us leaving everything behind from family, from belongings. At that time, my older brother has had two operations, saying because he was born with a very complex heart condition. And he was told the only place and the only way he can survive is potentially taking him to US or UK. So we knew we had to leave home one day, but we never expected we were gonna leave the manner that we did. We had to sell everything. And it's the only time that people didn't haggle for the price, but actually paid more to give us the funding, for, for allow us to leave. You, you put your faith, your money, but also your only way out of the situation to the people that you don't really want to approach. The whole scheme of traffickers was you you tell your contact, I want to get to UK in our case, and you're reliant on their network and their contacts because you literally get passed along from a trafficker to another one to another one. And you hope at the end of that journey, you actually get to your desired destination. In our case, that was UK. It was daunting, it was scary, it was unknown. But somewhere along that emotions, I knew I have to put my childhood to one side and somehow become an adult at the age of 10 and stick myself and the rest of the family in a hidden compartment off a car. And after a few days of traveling, the first city or the first time I, I venture out of that car is Moscow, a few weeks became six months and then we are talking getting picked up and getting dropped off to a middle of a jungle between uh, Russia and Ukraine and being handed off to traffickers with machetes where we met other people like ourselves and I never forget meeting a family and finding out about their older sister in this case, it was a it was a girl called Zara, and I, and I found out about her older sister was taken away from her family, and probably used for human and and sex trafficking. Hussein's condition after the two operation and growing up, and what we were told is, as he grows up and his heart gets bigger, he will function less and less because the way you need to circulate oxygen, his, his body just can't cope with it. So on that 18 months journey, we somehow tried to suppress emotions high and low 
because any of those could trigger him having a uh, an arrhythmia attack. Even though back of my mind, it was a constant fear, I had to have this crazy self-belief that we're going to get to UK safely, we're going to get there on time, and he's going to get what he needs, and he's going to survive this. And I think all of us created that mentality, and we're going to protect my inner fears from my other member of my family. And I think we've all done that individually without telling each other. And it created this strong unit of people that we will get this, but internally we were just hiding all our fears and emotions. From Ukraine, we talk in some other Eastern European country before getting into Austria, which is the halfway point. The first time I felt safe, uh, we went to a refugee camp where there was real gr- grass and other kids and could play football. But we knew we couldn't stop because we knew our location was UK. So Austria became Belgium, Holland, Germany, France. And 18 months later, we actually get to our location, which is UK. The one moment that I would say sticks in in my mind on that 18 months journey and I guess the realization how I was processing what was going on um, was actually we had to wait on the side of a road for a, a lorry driver who isn't aware of what's going on to stop a ladder's placed a knife's given to you and you've been told to cut a hole on a roof and you have a very small window to get into the to the roof and then the lorry is going to move and you're going to get to your location. Dad gets a knife, he goes up, he cuts it, family goes in and I'm the last one to go up the ladder. And I never forget this. As I'm going up the ladder and, I, and I'm on top of the roof, the lorry starts to move and the sensation that you are falling backwards And I had this weird flashback where I look to my dad's eyes, a way in my head saying, I hope you make the location. Don't worry about me. I'm okay. Goodbye. In an instant. I never forget this. I made my peace. And I never forget dad grabbing me with his hand and just pulling me into the to the lorry. As soon as we were in UK, we got a place in a local hotel in a city called Margate. And within a few weeks, they said, we place in you in a city called Cardiff in South Wales. We've never heard of it before. We didn't know where it was. All we knew is we we're going to have somewhere that we can call home. When we came to Cardiff, And I remember the faces of the volunteers being there and trying to be helpful and just smiling and happy and trying to talk to us in a way that we understand because obviously we didn't speak any English and those guys didn't speak any Farsi. The faith and humanity was starting to be restored in my mind over the next few months where we were in Cardiff and my brother going to the local hospital and that's when it hit me. They want to get him better. I knew my faith in in humanity was restored because the way they treated us, the guys in NHS didn't care where we were from, didn't care if you couldn't speak English, religion, culture, whatever. I do have a dream and a a hope that will never go away that in my lifetime I will see peace and prosperity in in Afghanistan and the, the younger generation will go on to have a fair chance at an education and, and to go on to follow their dreams. And there it is again. It's the same theme over and over and over. He ends there with the the hope in people's humanity. And, you know, it's like here in South Africa, the idea of Ubuntu is like used so much, you know, you, you hear that quote again. It's like, no, really visit it, really try to live it really try to see how many opportunities in life you get to be, you know, a person who sees another person's humanity. Because, you know, his story is insane what he had to go through before he saw that piece of humanity. 
It's so powerful. I agree. And then I love the way he talks about NHS like it's a place. And, and actually, you could read for that health workers anyway. You know, if we all acted like health workers do when you come, you know, health workers are just there to like assess what you're suffering and how can I make it better? We shouldn't all have to be in a health service to act like that when we're presented with a human or a family for whom something has gone wrong and to whom we can help. You know, I thought his story was amazing, but also really visceral, brings it to life, the fear and the terror. Who, I mean, who is going to do that voluntarily? You know, and at every moment, so close, like hanging on, just could have not made it. And obviously we must remember all the people who don't make it. But the way he found home in people, I think, is the thread of the series. Mm. It only makes the most sense to end this episode with our 30 second recap so that if anyone decided to skip the entire episode and just come here, we can at least give them 30 seconds of knowledge that hopefully empowers them to be the positive change. So are you ready? Let's give them. Okay, so, I mean, first and foremost, you just said it. Find out. I don't know is no longer an excuse to not do anything. Find out what is going on. And once you do, share it. Share it with other people. It does go a long way in the fight. And if you have... Whatever you have to give, actually, you might have a home, you might have a house, you might have some money. Whatever you can do, do give it because there are 84 million people are in need of it. And that's just now. Also, sign up for a buddy scheme. And and actually, as a language teacher, help people learn the language of their new home. And also the great oven. Join that. That's such a great solution. Oh, wow. Look how good. That was fantastic. I'm glad we got all of the information in there. I know. But and hopefully, well, I mean, don't talk yourself up yet. Let's see what the listeners say. But I agree with you. It was a meaningful 30. And I'm sure there's so many more things that we can do. So everybody who wants to do more, go over to the Global Goals website, which is globalgoals.org. And have a look on the Take Action Global Goal 16. But as I said earlier, one, two, three, four, they're all covered. So take a look at what you can do. So that's it. That's episode two. And I, that was a biggie. That was a lot. Definitely learned a lot in that one. And it's also like of the times. So people can really get involved almost anywhere in any way. I look forward to the next one. But for now, that is the end. And I'll see you next week. I'm Gail Galley saying goodbye. I'm Luis Matinga. I hope you can be the change. Cheers. Okay, I'm going to read the credits now. An Idiot's Guide to Saving the World is a Radio Wolfgang production made in collaboration with Project Everyone. The producers were Yelene Goffin, Holly Fisher, and Kieran Carruthers. The researcher was Emmeline Duffy. The executive producer was Ellie DiMartino. If you liked what you heard, please subscribe and leave a review because it helps other people find us. And the more people that find us, you got it, the more people are saving the world. This podcast is supported by Google.org. Thank you so much. Bringing the best of Google to help solve some of humanity's biggest challenges. Find out more at Google.org.